Tonight in Alexandria, the argument over birth control for school kids. Good evening, I'm Jim Vance. And I'm Dave Maris. Specifically, the argument is whether the city should establish a health clinic that can offer birth control devices to students at nearby T.C. Williams High. Catherine Couric is live now at City Hall in Alexandria, where the arguments still go on. Catherine? That's right, Dave, and it looks like this public hearing will continue well past midnight. There is no argument that Alexandria students need better health care, services like suicide prevention and drug abuse counseling. There is a big argument, however, over whether this clinic should dispense condoms and write out prescriptions for birth control devices without parental permission. Hundreds of citizens, including religious leaders, teachers, parents, and students, came to speak their minds or simply listen to others do so. Those who couldn't fit into the council chambers watched the hearings from TV monitors set up in other rooms. Wherever they stood on the issue, the speakers were equally determined, committed, and unyielding. You can give these teenagers, with your left hand, condoms and prescriptions for birth control devices, and with your right hand, encourage abstinence. The only long-term answer is teaching our children simply what is right and what is wrong, something we call morals. No, the clinic is not a free condone vending machine. It used to be that ignorance in this field merely resulted in pregnancy, in abortion, in sexually transmitted diseases, and sometimes even in infertility. That's bad enough. Now ignorance can result in death. But perhaps the most compelling arguments for the teen health clinics came from students themselves. A teen health clinic does not send out the message, have sex. It simply says, we care. Mayor Jim Moran has endorsed the idea. The city council is, is expected to vote on the proposed clinic sometime next week. But undoubtedly, the controversy will continue even after that decision is made. I'm Catherine Kirk, reporting live from Alexandria. Jim? Catherine? It is a tragedy that could happen to you. Lee Thompson and her staff have been looking at labs that do your medical tests. Tonight, the news that a third of the labs in Virginia are not regulated in any way. Only labs that do Medicare or interstate work are inspected in Virginia. Maryland and D.C. do inspect commercial labs, but they don't independently test the work that those laboratories do. Shock. I was in shock. Alexandra Sloan of Virginia was 29 years old when the laboratory pathologist reported she had cancer. And he had no doubt in his mind that it was a malignancy. And on that information, my doctor did a total hysterectomy. The laboratory's diagnosis was wrong. Alexandra Sloan had an operation she did not need. Now she can't bear children. Medical labs analyze everything from blood and urine to cancer and cholesterol. Most are well run and provide accurate results. But our four month investigation has found a disturbing number of errors and deadly mistakes. In a lab, many things can go wrong. Poorly calibrated machines, outdated chemicals, human error. A false blood sugar reading can mask diabetes. A misread strep culture can mean scarlet fever and damage to the heart. A bad PKU test, brain damage to an infant. In New York, the only state that independently tests labs for accuracy, 15% of the labs got a mark of marginal or below. That makes you wonder about our area, where no independent testing is done. News 4 looked at the records of all of the labs in our area that do Medicare work. In Maryland, 43% of those labs could not document they regularly inspected equipment and materials for accuracy. In the district, 42%. Virginia, 27%. In fact, quality control was considered so poor at six labs in Maryland this year, including the giant MetPath lab in Kensington, that Medicare threatened to cut off payments. No child should have to go through this. A MetPath report said this woman's 15-year-old daughter had gonorrhea. I think it was terrifying. It was humiliating. She was totally undone. Six days later, the lab corrected its report. The young girl never had gonorrhea. Did you ever ask whether it might be a mistake? Oh, definitely. We basically put forth the whole time that it was a mistake. And what did the doctor say? That laboratories did not make mistakes. Doctors assume that lab tests are accurate. So do we. And we feel even better if the lab work is done right in our personal doctor's lab. 
but 38% of the people in doctor's labs in our area have no lab training at all. Much more about that tomorrow night on News 4 at 6, and we'll have more on deadly mistakes at 11 as well. Jim. Lee Thompson, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lee. The Consumer Product Safety Commission today held its annual warning session about dangerous toys for sale in the holiday season. These are toys that can kill young children in ways that should be as appallingly familiar as they are appalling. Stores still stock toys that are so small they can easily choke a young child, like the yellow beads in this set. And you can still buy crib toys that a child can wrap around his neck with deadly results. And there are still toys for sale covered with deadly lead-based paint. One thing new this year, a federal assault on imported killer toys. The Custom Service has sworn to stop them at the dock. News 4 tonight has confirmed that a woman from Southeast D.C. who died two weeks ago may have been yet another victim of a deadly ambulance delay. As Jack Cloyley reports, it apparently was a case of bad information and an address mix-up. Lisa Wills was only 20, but she died the night of November 1st. She left behind a one-year-old son, a two-year-old daughter, and a group of distraught family and friends who blamed slow emergency response for her death. Oh, no! Oh, no! The transcript of the 911 calls obtained by News 4 shows that an ambulance got to Lisa Wills in seven to nine minutes. But it also shows that help should have gotten to her more quickly. The first call came in at 8.40. The transcript confirms Mary Will's account. I say my sister fainted and they can't get her to breathe. There were two more calls to 911 in the next minute. In each one, the caller stated that Lisa Wills was not breathing. What happened next could have been crucial to Lisa Wills' survival. The fire department dispatcher was required to assign this case a priority and the transcripts show that he didn't assign it a high enough priority. He put it out as a fainting, as a priority one. But fire department protocol requires that when a patient has trouble breathing, it's put out as a top priority, a priority M. In priority M cases, an engine company is dispatched immediately because a fire engine can usually get help to the scene in three to four minutes. But it took another frantic call from the family before an engine was sent and it went to 13th place instead of 13th Street. Meanwhile, the ambulance also went to the wrong address, eyewitnesses say, and it arrived on the scene seven to nine minutes after the first call. But the crew was unable to save Lisa Wills. She died at 9.35 p.m. Jack Lordy, News 4 Washington. The fire department maintains that its ambulance crew reached Lisa Wills in a reasonable amount of time and did all it could to save her life. A spokesman confirmed that when a patient is not breathing, that call should be given a top priority immediately. Stay with us for Bob Ryan's weather forecast and Arch Campbell with a sneak preview of Nuts, the new Barbara Streisand movie just opening. Also tonight, the Caps at home against the Red Wings and violence inside and outside one of the district's go-go clubs might have been avoided, that according to a city councilman. We'll hear from him in a moment. 25-year-old Stephen Howard Oaken surrendered to police tonight in Freeport, Maine, but not, police say, before he had murdered three women. Oaken is wanted for killing his sister-in-law and a neighbor in White Marsh, Maryland, and for the murder of a motel clerk in Kittery, Maine. He had been spotted by a hotel clerk in Freeport who had heard about Oaken on the radio and then found his car in the hotel parking lot. After a police tactical squad surrounded the hotel, Officers talked Oaken into giving himself up without resisting. Tonight, D.C. Council members Frank Smith and Wilhelmina Rolock are attacking the Board of Appeals in review for allowing Celebrity Hall to stay open. Two years ago, the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs recommended the hall's license be revoked because of violence and neighborhood complaints. But the Appeals Board ignored that action and allowed the hall to stay open while the owner appealed. Smith told News Force Pat Lawson the board exceeded its authority. The Consumer Regulatory Affairs uh, Office did its job. They said the, the license ought to be revoked. And then this group, uh, acting out of something that I think they had no basis to do in law, uh, decided to keep it open anyway. And I think it's about, it's a shame, really. And it's about time for them to have to come before the public and explain what it is that they did and why they did what they did. And the bill being co-sponsored by Wilhelmina Rolock and Calvin Smith would give the, or, or that is Frank Smith, would give the council power to confirm all future appointees to the board. 
Meanwhile, Smith is predicting quick passage of his bill to slap a curfew on kids who go to public dance halls. This comes after the Saturday night stabbing of 12-year-old Otis Nelson inside the club. We see police are trying to uh, figure out why a security guard at the hall led police to believe no one inside had been hurt. The police report says the victim wasn't located until 40 to 45 minutes after the attack. It is reported now, though, that, there, that an investigation is demonstrating that there is some dispute in terms of whether or not the stabbing happened, in fact, inside or outside the club. In the meantime, Nelson is in serious condition tonight at Children's Hospital. Well, Bob says in the space of the last six or seven days, we've had about eight or nine months' worth of weather We'll variety. just take and spread it out. What did you see? What's uh, most confused of all, too? The cherry blossom. One week ago, we had December rains, folks. Of course, the January snows tonight. Tonight would be right at home in May or June with showers and thunder showers, and of course, March. There it is. Cherry blossoms. South side of Capitol Hill. All this, it's very confusing. The skins are changing quarterbacks. What is going on in our part of the world? 69 degrees, not close to a record. Watch our weather in motion. First of all, let me show you what's happening. This is a line of showers and thunder showers for you folks out in Prince George's County right now, moving toward Annapolis, Upper Marlboro, spots like that, La Plata. Roberta Wa Rogers, our weather watcher in uh, White Plains, Maryland, reporting thunderstorms moving in right now. Uh, Bruce Caffer's had over an inch of rain in Casanova. Let me show you the satellite, and you can watch this weather front zipping our way. This time yesterday, we were getting into the mild air. Then this morning, it really came in on those southerly winds. Now, here's the leading edge of the dry air with a weather front coming right through us. 65 degrees right now in Washington. We've got a westerly wind with the moderate showers as the weather front has come through. The barometer rising. Dew point temperature is still a steamy 63 degrees. That's pretty humid, but it will be drying out. When we take a look at the satellite picture and zoom in, you can watch and see what's going on. This is the leading edge of the dry air, which right now is in parts of West Virginia. Our weather watchers out to the west reporting temperatures in the 50s at the same time. Uh, weather watchers like Bill Franklin down through the northern neck reporting temperatures in the 60s and right around Annapolis now. The uh, temperature also about 60 degrees out through uh, the uh, Delaware area. You folks out there will see the temperatures uh, continue to hold up into the 60s throughout the night. With time, all of this cloudiness will be moving out to the east. Let me take you uh, farther out into space and you can watch that storm. And, and it's been a real heavy producer of rain through the southeast. Move our way, but we will see it clear out by tomorrow as we get into southwesterly winds. Johnstown, Pennsylvania has had a wind gust to 50 miles per hour. Philadelphia, with this moist, warm flow up the coast, equal to record high temperature today of 72 degrees. There's the dry air. That will be in over us tomorrow. It'll actually be warm dry air. Right now out in Charleston, West Virginia, it's 58 degrees. In back of it, though, some chilly air will be heading our way as we head on into uh, late Thursday and Friday. Big piney Wyoming, only 10 degrees right now. My forecast for us for tonight, showers will be ending and also the thunder showers for you folks out to the east ending a little bit later on. Tomorrow when you get up, head out to work and head to school, it will be a spring-like morning. Temperatures in the 50s in the afternoon getting close to 70 degrees. Break out the sunglasses, dry and beautiful tomorrow. Cooler tomorrow night. Temperatures dipping back into the 30s, and then the chilly air continues. As we head on into Thursday, temperatures with partly sunny skies only about 50 degrees on Friday, uh, maybe back to December in the high 40s, but not a snowflake in sight. Temperatures over the weekend right now actually should actually feel like November, low to mid 50s, if in case you've forgotten. A week of weather. What have we had? Wow. We've had it all. Good Bob. day tomorrow. George Michael is next. Big night in sports. The Caps, the Bullets, the Hoyas, all in action tonight. We've got highlights. Stay tuned. Flat, dull, boring, uninteresting. Oh, they reek. Who? Capitals tonight. Oh, really? I was trying to get some that proper... Bad? Man, Ooh. when you get a power play seven times... And you still don't score. And that's as bad as walking a girl up to the date. You know, after a date, you stand, and you don't. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I don't know. Oh, I, don't. I know you don't know. That's right. You always. <laughs> this man always gets lucky. The Capitals couldn't do it tonight. They could not score for anything. They lose to the Detroit Red Wings one to nothing. Let's go to the Cap Center. We start with Jacques Demare, the coach of the Detroit Red Wings, trying to express his views. Come here, dummy. I am telling you that five plus one equals six. 
What, that's right. Five and one equals six. Well, Jacques got his point across. His Red Wings got their point across. Nice play from Bob Probert to Steve Iserman. Iserman would get the only goal of the game. Beats Pete Peters, who was frozen on the shot. That made it one nothing. The Capitals with some good scoring opportunities. Here, Hunter carries in. He'll feed to Mike Gartner. Gartner on the move. The Ooh. shot. Glenn Hanlon with 32 saves. And when the Capitals weren't shooting right at Hanlon, they were hitting the goalposts. Two of them tonight on this one. Hunter to Gartner, who's got the goal, but hits the goalpost. That's the way it goes when you get shut out. Capitals fall 1-0. Elsewhere in the NHL, New York Islanders over the LA Kings 4-3. Washington Bullets rally from a 28-point deficit. They still lose, but they did rally from that deficit. 105-101, to the Bullets fall to the Bulls. Chicago has won five of their first six. Let's go to Chicago. First half of the game, the Bullets in red. Jeff Malone taking the shot, missing. Charles Oakley clears the boards. The Michael Jordan over Bernard King, who was no defense. The Bulls led 64 to 40. They led by 24 at the half. Second half, replay again. Jeff Malone missing from the outside. Oakley, 21 rebounds ahead to Michael Jordan. But Jordan, folks, only had 20, uh, what, 26 points tonight. Here is the best for the Bullets. Down the lane goes John Williams. The Bullets closed within two. Then it was time for a little one-on-one -on -one move. I want you to watch Michael Jordan put a move on the Newt Bowl. Oh, that. Michael. Nice stuff. Man defies gravity. Yeah. Kevin Lockery, what'd you think? Yeah, that's what I thought, too. The Bullets fall to the Bulls. 105. How many times did he call timeout? Three. Two more, Kevin. Ah, oh, never mind. Forget it. Right. The Nets went into tonight's game. The New Jersey Nets, the only winless team in the NBA. They finally get one tonight down in Houston, 114 to 111. While the Nets get their first win of the year, the Celtics post their first loss of the year. Boston upset by Cleveland, 109 to 88. Let's go to Richfield, Ohio. First half of the game, the Celtics in green. Larry Bird, who played only the first half, to Dennis Johnson. Johnson rejected. Out comes the fast-breaking Cavaliers. Mark Price, the Dell Curry, local boy makes good. The Cavs were running the Celtics, 59-48 at the half. Second half of the game, Mark Price dishing off to Brad Darty. The Celtics look lifeless tonight. They fall 109 to 88. In the Meadowlands, the Rockets, and remember now, the Nets have not won all year. The Rockets, Rodney McCray is rejected from behind by Orlando Woolridge. Bagley with a nice save to Buck Williams. Is this offensive foul? Yes. Yeah. All right, you're all right. All right. Yeah. I thought it was a good shot. <laughs> no. Hey, look, so I don't care. I still <laughs> like it. And this shot counted too. John Bagley from three quarters oh, court. Oh. Yes. Hey, Jim Vance showed him this. He said, look, man, you close your eyes, you throw the basketball, That's you can right. make the highlights on the sports machine, and don't you know this is going to be a play of the month? John Bagley, oh, yeah. three quarters court. You know when you do that, you got to win. The Nets do, 114 to 111. Elsewhere in the NBA, Milwaukee crushed Golden State, 120 to 108. Georgetown Hoyas begin their exhibition season tonight. An easy 97 to 78 win over the Canadian national team. Let's go to McDonough Arena. In the second half of the game, Team Canada and Maroon. Rommel Raffin kept Canada early, even through, uh, close rather, even through early parts of the second half. Midway through the second half, however, the Georgetown Hoyas would begin to win it up. I mean, they were starting to roll. Once the Hoyas and John Thompson get on the run, Thompson, by the way, not in town. He's out scouting another team. Anthony Tucker going all the way. Anthony Tucker is only a freshman, but this guy everybody is talking about. Highlight of the game, for example, Charles Smith will come up with a nice steal. Charles Smith behind the back to Anthony Tucker. Tucker with nine points. He's one of the stars of the future for the Hoyas at Georgetown. It's a tough life being a cameraman, getting the perfect shot as Canada falls to Georgetown, 97 to 78. Congratulations to Toronto's George Bell. Becomes the first member of a Canadian team to win the American League's Most Valuable Player Award. I'm George Michael. That's today in sports. I wonder how many of those behind the head dunks Tuck will be doing when Thompson gets uh, back. Not many. <laughs> Speaking of Arch Gamble, he's next to answer an important showbiz question. Yes, is Barbara Streisand nuts or is nuts nutsy or what? What's the question? <laughs> Arch and Barbara do Christmas. Yes. <laughs> Gee, thanks. Yeah, you know, the holiday movie season almost here. Got a sneak tonight at the Tenley Circle for Barbara Streisand's upcoming Nuts. In this one, she's a hooker accused of murder. Her parents want to have her committed, but she fights for a trial to prove her sanity with the help of public defender Richard Dreyfus. All right, first thing is we got to get a shrink in here to take a look no. at you, and then you... No more shrinks. I'm giving you some very good legal advice here. Thank you very much. You know what I said about lawyers? Goes double for shrinks. Mrs. Draper, 
There are two psychiatrists who already say that you're crazy. You gotta have at least one psychiatrist who says you're not crazy or you don't have a case. Sure I do. I'm my case. I get up there, I say my piece, I prove I'm competent. Look, I don't know if you believe this or not, but I'm a perfectly sane woman. And I don't bother anyone who doesn't bother me first. You get it? And I don't want any more quacks running around in my head talking about my toilet training. And I don't blame you either. Nuts! If this is the kind of quality coming for the holidays, we're going to have a wonderful year end at the movies. It's a surprising side of her, too. The front. That's our story for tonight. Thanks for being with us. Tonight shows up next. Good night. <laughs>